Yes, you.
going to continue to worship together, and as we do, I invite our kids and middle schoolers to head towards their programs at this time. And as we conclude our uh, series on Psalm 23, we're going to sing a newer song together um, called Shepherd. I invite the words just to wash over you to make this your heart's prayer and to join in as you catch on.
God, we thank you today that in every circumstance of life, in every dark valley, you are the good shepherd. You lead us, you guide us, you protect us. And God, this morning we want to pray for those uh, dark valleys uh, that are very close to us and those that are around our world. God, we pray today for the dark valley that the people of Afghanistan are walking through. God, we grieve every lost life in that place this week. We mourn with those who are mourning in recent days. We pray for your, uh, your rod and your staff to protect all who remain in harm's way. We pray for all who find themselves displaced or who are suffering. God, we know that you are close to the brokenhearted. And so, good shepherd, we ask, would your peace reign in that place? God, we ask for your peace, too, for uh, all those places that are in the path of Hurricane Ida right now in the southern part of our country. God, we ask uh, for your protection for all those waiting anxiously for its arrival. And again, God, we pray for the most vulnerable, the most at risk. Would you uh, draw close to them, to every first responder, all who will be impacted by that event, God? And God, we ask too that you would be the good shepherd to us. If you walked into this place today carrying uh, something or walking through a dark valley, I just invite you now and just a brief moment of quietness to invite the Lord into that place. God, in all of those dark places, we ask, Good Shepherd, would you bring your goodness, your protection, your comfort, and your light? And we thank you that we can trust that you will do that because of who you are. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, do take a seat. Uh, good morning again. It's really uh, fantastic to see you today. We're so uh, glad uh, to worship together. If we haven't met, uh, my name's Andy, one of the pastors here. Uh, just got a few things uh, to let you know about today. Uh, the first is just a reminder, we have various in-person uh, services, so uh, you're at one of them, but there are... Uh, there's one more today uh, in Darien at 11 o'clock, and then in just a couple of weeks on September 12th, uh, our new Westchester location will be launching at the Radisson in New Rochelle, and so uh, we'd love to see you there uh, as well uh, if you are a Westchester uh, person in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, if you're new or is one of your first times uh, with us, we would love to connect with you, and you can do that using the Connect card uh, that's on the seats around you. You can fill that out and drop it in the mailbox uh, on your way out. And for all of us, there's a spot also there for prayer requests. We would love to pray for you uh, and care for you in any of the things that you uh, are going through. Uh, or if you have a praise report or just kind of a status update, something to share, we'd love to hear about that. So please do fill those out uh, and throw those in the mailbox on the way out. Uh, one quick save the date and a great way to connect is that coming up on October 9th for all the ladies, we have a women's breakfast uh, and conversation coming up with our very own uh, Jeannie Cunyon, who I think is here today somewhere. Jeannie's over there, so if you want to find out more, you can quiz the, the speaker over there. Uh, but uh, we would love, well not we, I won't be there, uh, Christine and the ladies would love to have you there, and uh, so save the date for that on October 9th. And then last but not least, I want to offer a big thanks to all of you who give and who uh, participate financially in the life uh, of our church. Uh, we really see that as uh, an extension of and a core part of our worship. Uh, we respond to who God is, not only uh, with our words and song, but all of who we are, including our finances. And if you'd like to give today, you can do so using any of those methods that are on the screen, including, again, uh, the mailbox in the back. Uh, so uh, I want to welcome Ben and uh, also our good friend Andrea to the stage, and they've got something for us. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so today, I have the honor of presenting Andrea Morella. You can come right over here. Uh, some, of, some of you may know Andrea or the Morella family. Uh, you've, been, you've been at Trinity for fi 15 years, and um, these are just very special people, and uh, they have walked a 
a, a unique um, a unique path, and it's been it has been a very hard road. I know we've walked as a church, we've we've journeyed with you over these years. But uh, there's an event coming up. But but even more than the event, we'd love to hear more a little bit of, of just your story and what you've been through for those of us who might not know you today. Thank you, Ben. Um, thank you to Trinity for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, I know. A lot of you already know my family story, but for those of you who are new to the church, and I think there are many, uh, we thought it would be good to share and um, tell you a little bit about what we've been through and uh, why we need your help. Uh, my son, Andrew, and my husband, Phil, are just outside here. Door is open. Um, but we try not to let um, Andrew hear the harsh reality of, of what's been going on. So briefly, uh, two of our four children were born with a rare degenerative and fatal disease called neiman pick type C. Uh, when they were diagnosed, we were told there was no cure, no treatment, and that children rarely live past their early teens. It was a nightmare, as it would be for any parent. So we started a foundation called Dana's Angels Research Trust, and DART for short, and we've been raising funds ever since, because as we all know, there's limited funding for rare diseases like Neiman Pick, uh, so it takes family foundations to support the research. Sadly, our daughter Dana passed away eight years ago, just 11 years from her 20, 11 days, sorry, from her 20th birthday. At that point, she had lost all her abilities. She no longer walked or talked. She had a feeding tube since she was 11, and then eventually needed a trach just to help keep her lungs clear. Our Andrew is doing relatively well. He's really been our miracle. He's benefited from the science that DART has actually helped fund through the years. We helped launch four drug trials in less than 10 years, which is a miracle. And Andrew has currently been in one now for over seven years. He gets a spinal tap once a month. That's how the drug is administered. He's had about 140 spinal taps. It sounds awful, but he's a trooper, and it is dramatically slowing the progression of the disease. We have brilliant scientists around the world and so many institutions actually studying Neiman Pick C. We have many biotech companies who have shown an interest recently in developing therapies for our rare disease, and it is rare. There's only five or 600 cases in the world that we know of. Um, but we need to fund the research. We can't stop, because to date, no child has survived Neiman Pixie, and we need to change that fate. So we're asking you, I'm here today to ask you to please help us in our efforts um, and sign up for our walk. We're having our fourth annual Dart to the Finish walk at Todd's Point on Saturday morning, September 25th. Uh, it's a two-mile walk around the beach. Ben is coming. <laughs> and um, we'll be out here after the service to sign you up, to give you any information, to answer any questions. Um, and you can c come in person. We'd love it or you can walk virtually. Either way, it's uh, helping us raise funds. Uh, you don't need a beach pass. Uh, it'll be, you just come in and say you're there for the dart walk and you're welcome to, to just come in. Um, every dollar we raise goes right to the research. We are an all volunteer organization. We have no overhead and just know your money is put to good use. It's where it needs to be. If you want to sign up online, you can go to dartevents.org, and it takes you right to the sign-up page. And just one last, last thing I wanted to add. Um, over the last 19 years that Phil and I have been dealing with this, people have often asked us how we stay so strong. Well, our strength and perseverance comes first from our faith and trust in God, and then secondly, just knowing that people out there want to help us and support our cause. And we have especially felt that here at Trinity. They have walked this journey with us for years, the staff and everyone who comes here. So 
We are relying on your help once again on behalf of Andrew and all the kids suffering with this. Please join us on September 25th. Thank you. Andrea, thank you. We, we love you. We love your family. Um, we're so honored that you're part of, it's great to be in this Trinity family together and I'll see you at the walk. Hope to see some of you at the walk too. It's a, it's a great time. There's also a, a virtual walk too if you're not able to physically be there, but uh, an, an amazing event. So thank you, thank you. So uh, at this time, we're gonna continue with our scripture reading. Uh, if you've been here at, at all during the Psalm 23 series, uh, just in honor of the Psalm being a global Psalm of global influence, we've been having somebody from uh, the Trinity community read it in a different language every week. And so this is our last one. Uh, this is Jinsu Park reading it, uh, Psalm 23 in Korean for us. 10편 23편 여호와는 나의 목자시니 내게 부족함이 없으리로다. 그가 나를 푸른 풀밭에 누이시며 쉴만한 물가로 인도하시는도다. 내 영혼을 소생시키시고 자기 이름을 위하여 의의 길로 인도하시는도다. 내가 사망의 음침한 골짜기로 다닐지라도 해를 두려워하지 않을 것은 주께서 나와 함께 하심이라 주의 지팡이와 막대기가 나를 안위하시나이다. 주께서 내 원수의 목전에서 내게 상을 차려주시고 기름을 내 머리에 부으셨으니 내 잔이 넘치나이다. 내 평생의 선하심과 인자하심이 반드시 나를 따르니 내가 여호와의 집에 영원히 살리로다. 하나님의 말씀이었습니다. 감사합니다. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, I'm Ben, if we haven't met before. And uh, it is great to be uh, together today. This is our last week in this series. Uh, in the month of August, we've been in this series, Life Without Lack, where we've been looking at uh, probably the most famous passage in all of Scripture, which is Psalm 23. And uh, the nature of anything that becomes uh, familiar to us is it be, can become a little bit like background noise, as we've said, right? Psalm 23, is there anything really new there? But we believe there is something there for us, and so that's why we've been digging into it and studying it for, through the month of August. And a bunch of us, if you got one of those bookmarks earlier on in the series, uh, we've been reading, I know a number of people in our church have been reading the psalm as a formative practice uh, every day out loud uh, over the past month or so. Uh, you might have read it so much that maybe you have it memorized at this point. Our six-year-old daughter memorized it. It is not only powerful, but also extremely cute to have her, have her say that. Less, I've memorized it too, less cute, a lot less cute, but it's been equally powerful in my own life. And again, even just being, being a pastor and being around, you know, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I've been around church for a while, and, and Psalm 23 has just been so fresh for me. Uh, over this past month, I find myself um, sort of just like soaking in this psalm. And I was this past week, I was walking somewhere and I was just saying it quietly under my breath, just saying the psalm out loud. And I could actually, as I said the words, I could actually feel uh, something shifting inside of me. I could actually feel my emotions and my thoughts gain a different area of focus. It was kind of like this quiet reminder of it, oh yeah, my well-being doesn't all depend just on me. It was that kind of reminder. Now, if you missed the previous messages, they're online. We'd invite you to go and check those out. But the real, the real power in Psalm 23 isn't in sermons about Psalm 23. It's in the psalm itself. And so actually, let's do this one more time here in this final week of this series. Uh, let's read this psalm uh, out loud together. And so if you're able to, if you're able to, I invite you to stand. Let's just read this psalm together one more time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, 
my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You can take a seat. Now, the thing about Scripture is that it's not just a Sunday thing. It's an everyday thing, and the more scripture we ingest, the more we meditate on scripture, the more we take into ourselves, um, it becomes, it's actually becomes a little bit easier for the Lord to speak to us, I find, uh, because you have a deep well uh, inside of you. And today we are finishing this series by looking at the last verse uh, in this uh, psalm. And for me, like on a personal note, this is probably the most, in my opinion, the most beautiful portion of this psalm. But one of my problems when I read this is how real does this feel to me? How, how accurate does this feel? Because, I mean, look at the confidence here, right? Look, look at these words. It's bold. It's almost bragging. But is this realistic? Is this just the biblical equivalent of, and they lived happily ever after? Because, I mean, doesn't Scripture actually warn us about being overconfident around the future? I mean, Proverbs 27, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Like, you have no idea. But for most of us, especially in a time like this in our world, uh, maybe this isn't our struggle. How confident are we really about tomorrow? Because for all of our education and for all of our innovation and technology and breakthroughs and and rightfully incredible things that human beings have accomplished and achieved, if we are really honest with ourselves, we have no clue about what's going to happen tomorrow. There are great experts in every field. There are predictions about politics. There are predictions about COVID. There are predictions about the economy. And to get any platform, to get uh, certainly a talk show or something, you have to have an opinion, a a clear opinion, and you have to say it loudly over and over and over again with passion, with commitment. And the more confident you sound, the more airtime you're going to get. But we don't really know. But this psalm is a bull's claim. It's saying, I am unshakably sure about the future. I'm unshakably sure that I have a shepherd, and because of that, goodness and mercy are following after me. But here's the question for us to wrestle with. How many of us actually feel this level of confidence about Jesus? Now, we can say it when times are good, right? I have great health, I have a great job. You know, things are going well for me. I have a vacation planned. My portfolio is growing. Family stuff is going okay. Relationships are going well. Yeah, surely goodness and mercy will follow after me. It's easy to say it then. But the power of Psalm 23 doesn't come by pointing out the obvious good things in my life when they're there. The power of this psalm is unlocked when circumstantially there is nothing praiseworthy, when there is nothing uh, that is good. When humanly speaking, uh, it doesn't seem to be goodness and mercy chasing after me. When I look over my shoulder, maybe there's other things that feel like they're chasing after me. Unpaid bills. My mortgage is chasing after me. That doctor's report is chasing after me. That broken relationship. That dysfunctional family dynamic. That temptation is chasing after me. That addiction is chasing me down. My anxiety, my fear, depression, dashed dreams, scarcity, chasing after me. And maybe that feels very real today for some of us. Where you're looking behind you and you're just wondering, like, what's next? What else is going to happen in my life? And those are the times that test what I actually think about Psalm 23. And so there are two ways to think about this, especially this last line of uh, what the psalmist is saying. Either he's living in fantasy land, that he is delusional, he is nuts, or he's right. Like either these are just kind of the, you know, 
positive thinking tricks um, to help himself through some hard times? Or does he know something that we actually need to know? And so what has to happen in a person's life to get them to the point where they can actually genuinely say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so in the rest of our time today, we wanna look at two things. We wanna look at where David finds his confidence and then we wanna look at uh, our invitation as we wrap up this series. What is, we believe, God's invitation to us as we uh, move from this uh, this psalm. And so first of all, where does David's confidence come from? Because he seems to have a lot of it. And really, when you look at this, uh, especially this verse six, there's a twofold confidence that's rooted in God's promise in God's presence. First of all, his promise. Now, I don't know what memories, what thoughts come to mind, maybe what hap- what's happening in your life right now when you hear the word Promise. I remember uh, one of my friends in high school, uh, he was the kind of guy, he had a lot of, he was very uh, energetic, he was always excited about things that were happening, and he would promise a lot of things, right? And so if he said to you, Ben, I'll I'll meet you there at six o'clock, you could be guaranteed that he would not be there at six o'clock, like you show up, you're, it's just gonna be you there. And he would always do that. And at first it was kind of okay. It was like, oh, that's just who he is. But after a while it was like, no, that's actually who he is. Like he, he's not dependable. He's not gonna follow through, whether it's a small thing like showing up at six or it's something bigger. Now I would imagine that all of us, that's a very small example compared to maybe some of the stories of broken promises that maybe some of us have walked through with people that you trusted who said, yeah, this is gonna happen. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna provide. I'm gonna be there for you, and they weren't. And because of that, that can, that can kind of uh, make us very suspicious about any kind of promise or any kind of claim like that. It can make us feel unsettled and shaky. I like what uh, Ronald Rollheiser said said, what opposes faith is not so much worry about this thing, uh, that, uh, this or that particular thing as uh, worry that God has forgotten us. Worry that our names are not written in heaven, that we aren't in good hands, that our lives aren't safe, and that there is every reason to fear and be anxious because at the core of things, there isn't a benevolent, all-powerful goodness who is concerned about us. But Dave, for David, this isn't his concern. He, he knows God has not forgotten me no matter how it looks. And God never will forget me because David knew God's promises, that God is always true to his own nature and character. God isn't a liar. God shows up. God keeps his word. And because of that, he's able to declare goodness and mercy are gonna follow after me. These words, uh, goodness and mercy, in the, the Hebrew language there, tov and hesed. Uh, tov is good, perfect, desirable. It's the way things were meant to be. And hesed is this beautiful biblical word that there's no real direct translation for in the English language. It's kind of a combination of uh, things like loyal love, uh, loving kindness, steadfast love, covenant love, favor, mercy, grace, compassion. Has said is a one way love. It's a stubborn love where what you do doesn't affect someone's has said for you. See, David, though, wasn't saying anything that was that new here. He was simply talking about the promises of God. These were covenantal promises of God to his people. And when you look at promises in scripture, there are literally hundreds of uh, promises that the Lord makes. Here are just a few. Here's just a few for a sampling of some of the promises of God. I will give you rest. I will strengthen you. I will answer you. I will bless you. I will not fail you. I will provide for you. I will never leave you. I am for you. I will direct your steps. Who wants some of that today? 
And the thing that holds these promises together, the thing that, the kind of like the super glue or the superpower of sorts that makes all of these promises uh, uh, work is this thing called grace. It's unmerited favor that God's goodness and mercy are gonna chase after you because that's his promise to you. I, I believe a lot of Christians today, a lot of followers of Jesus today are living a, a different version of this story a different kind of gospel story that maybe we could call the gospel of self-improvement. And it sounds something like this. I, I, I become a Christian, I give my life to Jesus, and then I have to sort of take up the torch and I have to try really, really hard to make sure he continues liking me and kind of just hope for the best. And so this is Christianity mixed with individualism, mixed with hustle culture, mixed with self-reliance. And here's just a few possible signs that maybe some of this is present in, in your own life. Or maybe the, there's somebody else who's, someone who loves you would be able to see these and recognize some of these things in your life, okay? So a couple possible signs that the gospel of self-improvement is present in my life. I'm more interested in fixing the outside than the inside. Or right? because there's persona management, and so even if I've got stuff going on the inside, I, if I look okay, that's good, that's okay to me. How about this? Prayer is typically a last resort for me. So I'll try, I mean, yeah, I believe in prayer, but I'm gonna do what I can, humanly speaking, and if it gets really bad, then maybe I'll, I'll bring it before God. If I do pray, it's almost always urgent petition, asking, rather than, a loving uh, converse, a conversation with somebody who loves me. How about this one? My unspoken theology is God helps those who help themselves, which in some surveys was the most popular verse in the Bible. Unfortunately, it's not in the Bible, but uh, still popular nonetheless. How about this? I respond with anger or entitlement when others don't live up to my expectations. Because if I'm living a, a life of self-improvement, then you better improve yourself too, right? You should try harder too. And if, if not, then what are you doing? Are you even trying? And so I see others through the lens of judgment. I, another one, I'm frequently stressed or anxious about not being good enough. And I don't even know what good enough is exactly, but I, I, I feel restless about it. I feel angsty about it, right? I, I must be better in some way, even if I can't articulate what that would look like. And then finally, I assume I have all the resources to change within myself, that I can just do it. If I just figure it out, if I just unlock that, it will happen. Right? The gospel of self-improvement. Now, of course, to just be very clear on the flip side of this, to use theological language, we hope that, there, that our justification leads to sanctification. That is, we hope there is actual life change to following Jesus. The antidote to the gospel of self-improvement isn't just do nothing and like, oh, Jesus loves me, so I'm just gonna go on autopilot for the rest of my life. Jesus does love you, but autopilot is not your calling. Now, we hope that there is life change. We believe that when Jesus forgives us and saves us, that actually leads to a life of repentance and a life of humility and a life uh, toward maturity because that's natural and that's good. But the promise of the shepherd is that if you're a sheep in my flock, I've got you. I've got you because I've got you. His desire to rescue me isn't diminished by my own stubbornness or my pride. Because Psalm 23 is not the gospel of self-improvement, it's the gospel of grace, right? The psalm doesn't say, you know, or the psalmist doesn't say, hey, I can feel good about tomorrow because I'm such a good sheep. I can feel good about tomorrow because uh, I'm so smart. I'm so resourceful. I'm such a good planner because of my moral excellence and my piety. No, the promises of God, the promises of the shepherd are not based on the faithfulness of the sheep. Right? Provision for the sheep is an act of grace. The sheep doesn't earn it. It simply cooperates with the shepherd to receive it. And so David is saying here, ultimately, 
when he says that, that, that mercy, that the goodness, that these things are running after me, here's what he's saying. You, you can't outrun grace. Grace runs faster than you. you. You might have some fast runners here today. Grace runs faster than you, right? Because that's who God is, and that is the first thing that brings such confidence to David about his, his, both his present and his future. So it comes from God's promise, but his confidence also comes from God's presence because there's this reality that's woven uh, throughout the psalm, and that is the shepherd, every single verse, one way or another, the shepherd is always with the sheep. I remember someone here uh, saying that uh, the Christian walk could be summed up in one sentence, that is, in one, this one phrase, to live ever aware of God's presence to live ever aware of God's presence. Now, what's God's presence? We could do a whole series just on God's presence. Well, sometimes we think of God's presence as a feeling or an ambiance or uh, a, an atmosphere. I remember being, when I was uh, in, I went, as a teenager, I went to a youth conference and somehow the presence of the Lord, whenever the subwoofers came on and the fog machine came on, there was always the presence of the Lord. Like, was that the presence of the Lord or was that a fog machine? and lights, I'm not exactly sure. But the presence of the Lord can be and can feel like an atmosphere or something like that. But in the Old Testament, uh, it, was, it was about being before God. The word that's often translated uh, as pre- uh, presence, it can also be translated as face. The presence of God, the face of God. That is a close and a personal encounter with the Lord. Uh, God's presence is everywhere, and yet the heart of the believer is to fully experience that. We can't control it. We can't manipulate his presence. We can't, uh, like, manufacture it, but we can position ourselves in such a way that we'd be more open to it. And and then in the New Testament, uh, we're told that God's presence becomes fully manifest in Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit makes that real and tangible for us to be able to perceive and sense him more than just a, an idea about God, more than a doctrine about God, right? It's the difference between having a sense of my wife and, knowing, and actually knowing my wife. Like a sense of my wife, like I read her biography. I know some facts about her. I heard someone talk about her one time. When I know her, though, I know her, her, her way of thinking. I know her voice. I know what she, what she enjoys in life or doesn't enjoy. I know her dreams, her hopes. I know her thoughts about me because I know her, right? And so for David, that's what he's experienced. He has tasted the goodness of God's presence, and it's developed a craving in his life. It's developed a habit And I was reflecting on this. You know what? Uh, The longing for God's presence is the only addiction that won't eventually destroy you. And here's what he wants. Here's what he wants more of, to dwell in God's house. To dwell in God's house. Now, we're not talking about physical, like God's apartment. We're talking about the reality that we'll ultimately experience in eternity with him, that we can actually pull that into the here and now. God's face, God's presence, to be in God's presence. That's what David wants most. And so that's a fair question for us today, and I've been wrestling with this question. What is it that you want most? What is it that you daydream about? What is that thing that if you had it or had more of it would make you feel really okay and safe. For David is to dwell in the house of the Lord. And here's the thing. There are imitations of home, right? There are substitutes of home. And it's important to know the real thing because it's very easy to get confused between the real and the fake. And I remember a few years back talking to a dad uh, who had taken his young toddler, maybe like three, four-year-old young son, to Ikea. Now, if you've ever been to an Ikea before, uh, inside there's like a lot of um, mo- kind of like model rooms where they put all the Ikea furniture in. They're like, here's what it could look like in your home. And they look very convincing. They're very realistic, well done. They put a lot of time into making them feel like it could actually be someone's home. 
And so this dad is with his young, uh, his young boy and he turns his back for a moment and he's looking at something and then he looks around. He's like, where's, where's my son? And so he wanders around in the apartment and the son has also wandered before him in the apartment and has wandered into the bathroom. And again, these are very realistic uh, mock-ups here. And he, to his horror, he looks over and he sees his young son fully utilizing the fake toilet in, uh, in the Ikea. <laughs> He's horrified. He takes his son. See, it's important to know what the difference is between imitation and real. David, that's a, that's a really silly illustration, but David knows the difference to dwell in the house of the Lord. He's not saying, I want to scope out the furniture there. He's saying, I want to be with the host. And notice what it says, dwell. It doesn't say visit. It doesn't say check out. It doesn't say do a Bible study about. It says, I want to be there. I want to be there 24-7. And so when the psalmist imagines bliss, peace, satisfaction, right? There's a lot of other things he could say. I mean, after all, he would go on to become king, right? He, he's, experienced everything, he, he's experienced everything that somebody could experience. And he's not like, bliss for me is a new sports car. Bliss for me is, uh, is to be the envy of all my peers in my industry. Bliss for me is to retire on the beach. He says, no, I want to be in God's presence, and so as we think about that, again, if we were to take out a piece of paper and sort of rank order things in our lives that we long for more of, would God's presence make our list? Yeah, I was thinking about this just uh, yesterday. What if this psalm ended without today's verse? Like, what if it ended and we still had green pastures and we still had the still waters and we still had the rod and staff and he still anointed our head with oil? But for David, that wouldn't be good enough because we would not dwell in God's presence. And for David, that is the best part. See, Psalm 23 is about having a hunger for God's presence more than just having a hunger for God's blessing. I appreciate what Pastor Derwin Gray said about this. He said, if he gave us everything we prayed for, we would begin to worship the things he gives, uh, gives us instead of him. And I think there's probably some truth to that. David is saying, God, I want you more than I want the stuff I can get from you. And God, I do want provision. I do want guidance. I do want pr uh, protection, all these things. But more than that, I want you. You see, I don't think David was actually boasting about tomorrow. David was boasting about God. He was saying, this is who God is. And so he found a confidence in God's promise. He found a confidence in God's presence. But as we wrap up this series, the point isn't just to say, um, you know what, I learned an interesting fact or two about Psalm 23, interesting nugget, and I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna put this back on the shelf and kind of forget about it. That is not God's heart for us. I believe God has an invitation to us as we wrap up uh, this month in this psalm. And here it is. To dwell with the shepherd together. Psalm 23 is uh, really a description of what apprenticeship to Jesus can actually look like. In another psalm, David says this, one thing I have asked for and that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The great philosopher Kierkegaard once said that purity of heart is to will one thing. And when we have a center in Christ, when we will one thing with our gaze on the kingdom, we start to experience a new kind of freedom. That's the freedom we've been talking about in this series, and that's the thing that provides a life without lack. But do we believe this here in this last talk in, these, in this series do we really believe the words of Psalm 23 are for us? Or is this sort of a nice spiritual placebo? Are these just nice words or are they true words? Now, when you're in a hard place, when you're in the valley, people can try different things to cheer you up. 
right? Some will just try that. They'll say, I wanna cheer you up. Like, you know, turn that frown upside down. You know, there's other fish in the pond. Something will work out. God had a plan. And they'll try to just cheer you up with cliches and things like that. You know, look on the, on the bright side. Smile a little bit more. Others will have a different approach and they'll try to solve your problem for you. Well, have you tried this? Have you Googled that? Here's, have you tried this approach? And all of them, those friends may be well-intentioned trying to get rid of the pain for you, but the good shepherd does something very, very different. He walks with you in the valley. See, the trial might still be there. The valley didn't change, but you're changed by his presence. Psalm 23 is not about escapism. It's about ushering in the peace and the wholeness of the kingdom of heaven here and now. And over the centuries, countless believers have experienced this for themselves and have learned this, not by hearing a sermon about it, not by someone telling them it's true, but by actually experiencing it for themselves. And Jesus, friends, Jesus is inviting us to experience this psalm for ourselves too. Again, this invitation to dwell with the shepherd. But the second part of that is together. We have been in such a time of disruption, of dislocation, of isolation. I spoke with a few uh, folks in our church this past week who were just telling me, they're like, I feel so disconnected. I feel so dry relationally, spiritually, I feel disconnected from church, from friends, from the Lord. And one of the things that we take away from this psalm to remember, and it's almost like, it's, it's so obvious that we almost like don't think about it, but sheep are part of a flock, part of a whole. And there's a, a common expression in the English language, a lone wolf. Guess what's not an expression? A lone sheep, because it's not a good idea. It doesn't go well for the sheep. It's not what you're supposed to do. It's not healthy. It's not going to end well. And so in this time of disconnection, lean in, engage, count the cost of community, yes, but, but, but step in, be present. God, yeah, God cares about me, but he cares about us and he cares about how we interact and how we treat other people. This psalm isn't just about hoarding more of God's goodness for ourselves. It's allowing that presence to transform and heal and restore so that we actually have something to give. And here's the point. If I lack warmth, if people see me and they're like, man, Ben lacks warmth. He lacks affection. He lacks goodness and mercy. That's to, at least to some degree, you know what that means? That my tank is empty. That means I haven't spent enough time in the shepherd's presence to bring about the deep inside out heart change that it's actually required to pull that off. And so that would be our prayer for our community coming out of this psalm, that we would dwell with the shepherd together. And I want to end with this. There's a, a passage from John chapter 6 that uh, I've come in the last couple months. I've come across this in different ways a number of times, but I've really been thinking about it recently. And the, the context is Jesus has been uh, teaching and and spending time with his disciples, and things have kind of gotten harder, and and his his teaching has gotten harder too. And it says this in the text. So Jesus is doing his thing, and it says many of his disciples turned back and, and no longer followed him. And I don't know what their internal monologue was. You know, it's, it's getting too hard. It's, I'm not sure there's a payoff. I'm not sure this is actually going to work. I'm not sure we can actually depend on this. I'm not sure it's going to make a difference. And so Jesus sees many of the larger group of disciples heading out. And then he turns to the 12 and he says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Are you going to head out too? And then Simon Peter thinks about it and answers, and he says this, and this is the line that I've been reflecting on. Lord, to whom shall we go? Jesus, where else would we possibly go? I want to invite us to stand. That is the heart, I believe, of God's heart for us coming out of this psalm. 
where else would we go? You can run, you can, you can try a lot of things in life, but ultimately there is nobody like the good shepherd. There is, there is no other way to, to meet that, need, that, that, that sense of lack that is so uh, uh, pervasive in our lives in different ways. There's no way to, uh, to get rid of that just through human effort, through trying different things. We need Jesus. So it come, it's as simple as that in the end. Where else would we possibly go? That's his heart for us today. Jesus, we thank you uh, for, uh, for your goodness, for who you are. We thank you that you are our good shepherd uh, today, that you are the one who fulfilled all of the promises, that you are the one with his said love for us, that love that will never, ever let us go. And so right now, Jesus, we... Uh, we have, there's this great exchange of uh, your abundance for our lack. We receive your abundance. We receive your peace. Help us to trust. Help us to trust when we can't see well, when we can't see in the dark, when we can't see what you're doing. We thank you that you love us, that you want to protect us and guide us, that you want to provide for us. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.